Perfect. First question is this gentleman over here on my left. Yes, thank you, everyone. Um, the, uh, I've got a question for Mark, uh, Mark Ship. Uh, we heard comments earlier today about the FMD status of India. Uh, I'd just like uh, to get Mark's view on the FMD status in India and possible USDA listing of their plants and his assessment of risk if box beef from FMD countries uh, came into Indonesia. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so I India is a, an FMD endemic uh, country and uh, uh, despite that uh, disease status, it, it is exporting significant amounts of uh, beef, um, either legally or, or illegally, uh, and uh, there's been significant movement of, of product from India in, into uh, other countries, including Indonesia and Malaysia, for a number of years. That, that, that trade has been there uh, for a, a significant period of time, and as yet we've not seen uh, consequences, but I think it's only a matter of time until we do see consequences. Because of that, it, it poses a, a significant uh, biosecurity risk to the region and, and as a consequence to Australia. So uh, it, in that sense, it, it, it's of uh, serious concern. What we can do about that is, is uh, to improve our intelligence, and we've done quite a lot of, of that in the region, uh, looking at where FMD outbreaks are, where the trade routes are, where are the likely uh, sources of uh, FMD in the region. Uh, what can we do to improve uh, our border controls to ensure that uh, it doesn't enter Australia? FMD can only enter Australia through animals or through products, and, and we've t significantly tightened up our intelligence and our ability at the border to, to manage that risk. So I think that the risk environment has deteriorated, uh, but, but our uh, tools have improved. Yes, sir, right in front. Khan Joel from the Commonwealth Bank. I have a question for Ms Bradshaw. Um, Ms Bradshaw, you touched on topics such as uh, reduction of mortality, reduction of stress, um, pain relief by genetic improvement and so forth as means of improving animal welfare. I was wondering, from the RSBCA's point of view, how does it see itself in promoting the research and development piece there and improving genetics generally? trying to do by putting out the beef cattle guidelines in which those areas are mentioned is to um, flag that those are areas for improvement and um, we have a full scientific team who um, pull, pull together all the research from around the world and look at what's you know what the trends are etc so um, very much we're, we're very very involved in, in um, making sure that there's progress on those fronts and obviously again you know we're talking about incremental improvement so uh, that's really um, what we stand for. Can I follow on from that? What's the extent of collaboration with industry players? Because these are obviously um, issues of great importance to them as well in terms of continuing to improve their herd yeah. profile and genetics. Yeah. Well, um, this document was produced actually in collaboration <laughs> with um, producers and with industry. So um, it is a document that um, hasn't, it's obviously not been thought up in the back room. <laughs> um, and it is all about collaboration and, and engagement. And um, whether, you know, we have enough of it, um, you know, I, it's, very, it's very difficult to sort of say, well, there is, in, there is enough collaboration. <laughs> Um, but um, as far as the RSPCA is concerned, uh, th that's what we do. That's what we do for, for a living, so to speak. Um, we work with everybody to um, identify what the issues are and then put forward a um, pl plan to, um, <clears throat> you know, make those improvements. But uh, I personally uh, would, li would like to see um, a faster progress uh, on some of these issues. We can only get that if uh, people are prepared to own animal welfare, as I said earlier. Uh, Mark Ship, if I may, you have probably uh, an, a unique international perspective on animal welfare issues that most of the rest of us don't. On a worldwide scale of animal welfare, where would Australia fall in your view? Um, 
I, I believe that Australia is a, a, a leader uh, in terms of animal welfare, um, but a, a leader with, with certain characteristics in that uh, we, we take a very pragmatic approach. Uh, we, we try and find solutions that will work on the ground, that can be implemented and, and that have meaning. Uh, often uh, uh, groups will point to the EU as, as a leader in terms of animal welfare. Uh, but often the, the solutions or, or the, the uh, standards that they put in place are very difficult to implement um, in a real-world setting. And I, I think uh, the, the fact that we have uh, got that track record and, and we're now getting that recognition internationally and, and being called upon as a, as a, uh, a mentor in, in developing uh, standards that can be uh, used in, in a practical sense rather than just in a theoretical or academic sense uh, points to, to the leadership that Australia has shown in this area over a number of years. How significant is that recognition? How, how real is it in other parts of the world? Um, as I said, uh, we, we initiated the, uh, the regional animal welfare strategy uh, and that, that took a, a significant amount of effort and, and there are people here in the audience that, that played a large uh, part of, uh, in that. Having established that, that regional uh, strategy, that's now been adopted by the OIE uh, across a number of regions. Um, when, when I go and travel internationally, I often have people come and talk to us about what's your experience, what, what can you give us in, in terms of assistance or training, uh, what, what do you have in, in terms of documentation that we can pick up and use. Um, the, the fact that we uh, took the OIE standards, which are uh, internationally accepted standards and then developed a checklist and, and built a, a regulatory system around those is, is admired around the world and uh, is being picked up uh, by a number of countries uh, on, off the back of SCAS that they're saying, well, if, if that's what Australia wants for uh, exported livestock, then we're going to look at that in terms of our domestic uh, livestock. And, and that was the type of flow on effect and spillover that we were hoping to see. And that's what we are starting to see. Thank you. Uh, now we have a question over here. Uh, Judith Laffin, Agricola Oz. A question for uh, Lynn Bradshaw. Um, given uh, looking at uh, the changes in uh, the live animal trade in East Asia over the last 20 or 30 years, one notes that as incomes have risen, there's been a gradual change from live animal trade to uh, processed uh, beef and sheep meat, uh, and lamb, etc. Um, given that, that many of the countries that uh, take a live animal uh, in their imports, whether from Australia or other countries, are very low income countries with very poor cold chains or no cold chains, how re realistic is it for the RSPCA to be advocating an end to live uh, exports of, uh, of cattle and other animals uh, for slaughter? Um which is a really good question and um, I, I think we have to take it from the perspective that we're an animal welfare organisation and we have to put forward our views on what's best for, for the animals in this case. And um, as practices in overseas countries or you know, shifts in, in the way things happen um, occur, um, maybe you know, there's more of an opportunity to um, do things differently. But I think that um, we would be remiss as an organisation if we didn't set uh, the benchmark to say, look, we can do, we can do things better here, uh, in a, in, sorry, better um, overseas in, 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 a, in a better way. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit tongue-tied here. But um, the reason that we're uh, advocating uh, the way we are is that there's no guarantee as to what happens at the other end in the case of the live export. And the SCAS system is a step in the right direction but it's not foolproof. Um, and I think that the argument about, um, well, people don't have fridges or, you know, whatever, um, it's uh, something that's going to change over time. And uh, is that the justification for us saying, well, look, we back off on our live export message? Probably not. Question in the front here. <coughs> Uh, Nathan Westling from McBride. I um, want to ask a meat question from Michael and Malcolm. Uh, do you see any opportunities in the mutton market given low domestic consumption and precarious live exports? 
Uh, I'll, I'll start very briefly and then hand over to the uh, to, to Malcolm. Uh, are you talking domestically or by trade or either or? Um, I don't, look, I don't have a good, uh, I think Malcolm will have a good uh, or a better finger on the pulse feel for these kind of opportunities that I might hear. I think um, it's, I think it's an area we have to, um, Firstly, I think it's an area we have to look at because I think some of the other there is some pressure in some of the other exporting industries, and um, but I don't I don't know that the pressure comes necessarily from live animal exports. I think the point about live animal exports is they are to particular markets at the moment and they are a small slice of the export action in meat and livestock industries in Australia. Um, so uh, I guess the general um, starting point is that mutton isn't the premium product. It's uh, lamb is the premium product for, for those animals. So um, you might be looking at different markets or you might be looking at, at uh, trying to expand into certain areas um, where you're looking for, in a sense, almost a cheap bulk commodity kind of, kind of export. Um, there is, uh, I mean, Lynn's raised the issue that's been used in, uh, around the live export trade of um, uh, you know, in response to the question about how good are the, is the supply technology and storage technology on the other side of the uh, export, you know, the far end of the export chain, is there refrigeration, is there storage and all that sort of stuff. Um, so, you know, obviously there is where um, cheaper meat products might be um, saleable and certainly in the major cities of the countries that we export to. They have supermarkets, they do have electricity, they do have storage and refrigeration. Um, so those might be areas where we could look at those kind of markets, but I probably don't have a more uh, precise answer than that. So with that, I'll pass over to Malcolm and see what he's got to say. Look, yeah, um, it, it is a, going to be a niche market. Um, so I am aware of markets where, for example, mutton is cubed and then sent to be a filler for, for goat meat. Okay, so it's seen to goat as the, the primary product and we, the mutton is used as a filler to expand it out. I dare say there's some analogies with horse meat and beef burgers, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's, done with every, it, it's done with everybody's knowledge on the way through. And look, I do think that what we will see in the emerging markets, and, and Mark's made the point and Lynn's made the, the point, that a, in a lot of our developing markets where uh, meat is sent, okay, is the predominance around the wet market still exists. So you can be in downtown Shanghai, one of the great cities of the world now, and the wet market is still there and alive and well. And within those large numbers of apartments within Shanghai, you will start to see refrigeration become part of it and people will buy chilled meat products and be able to cook at home and all the rest of it. And you will see a move away from, from poultry and fish as being the, and pork being the primary source of protein and you will see beef and, and sheep meat become part of that. And then those markets will open up on, on the way through. But it is, it's going to be evolutionary, okay? Um, and it could well be, okay, that in the future, you know, there is no place for live export in Australia. It won't be in any time in the, the near future, but I think uh, th this will be the, the place where se what we would consider a secondary meat cut will actually be an acceptable meat cut in other parts of the world. In the same way people eat buffalo, where we wouldn't eat it as a rule in Australia, etc. on the way through. I, I see all of those opportunities opening up, but at the moment, the opportunity for mutton, I suppose, is more niche than to mainstream. Now, a question up here. Sophie Morris from the Australian Financial Review. A question for Malcolm Jackman. You said that uh, the implementation of SCAS had damaged some key trading relationships and that a lot of work needed to be done on restoring those. Are you talking there about uh, ministerial visits or what sort of work do you think needs to be done there and can you identify which relationships in particular need that work? Also, you mentioned uh, some of the costs of SCAS bungles, I suppose, the compliance costs on business. Um, on balance, do you, you said it was well intended. On, on balance, do you think it has had um, benefits from an alpha animal welfare perspective, or do you think the costs outweigh the benefits? No, I, a number of questions there, Sophie. I'll try and remember them all. Um, just firstly, on the cost issue on the way, way through, at the end of the day, 
Um, we understand the cost of doing business in Australia in an Australian regulatory environment that the government imposes upon us and the pluses that come from that in terms of animal welfare. So whilst it has cost, okay, I think the benefits for it from it have been, uh, have been good and acceptable from our point of view, but it has cost money to, to implement on the way through. What it has done, okay, it's actually narrowed the competition. So it's basically the bigger players are now uh, in the, that sector because they can afford to, to put in place the supply chains, to get the audit trails, to put the vets on ships, to put the animal welfare officers on the ground on a full-time basis. And so the ability of an individual entrepreneurial exporter to basically book space on a sheep on a ship, sorry, to, to gather some cattle and to move it into a market are almost gone. You, you just can't do that anymore. So that sort of, uh, in some respects, the cost benefit has been offset because players such as elders have been able to, to probably take a larger market share in a, a shrinking market on the way through. Um, I do think that uh, there has been significant political damage in um, in Indonesia on the way the ban was imposed. We see similar issues in Japan, not so much at a political level, probably more at a commercial level, where the market into Japan has been there for 20 or 30 years. It's a very small market. It's all Wagyu beef. These are animals that are, are pampered uh, to, to an extreme degree almost. And Japanese importers are saying, we are getting punished and we are paying a financial penalty for rules implemented by Australia that apply to a completely different market. Um, do we need to do more with Indonesia? I think, yes, we do need to do a lot more with Indonesia, our nearest neighbour, okay, um, and from an agricultural soft commodities import export point of view, I think we do very poorly. It's our largest grain market, 22% of our grain, give or take a splash, goes to Indonesia. Um, and yet we are one of the smaller, uh, we have a minute amount of fresh vegetables and produce goes into to Indonesia. Indonesia is a great untapped market that successive governments seem to ignore. Um, and, and we need to do a lot more around it. Regretfully, I suspect that we will need a, a change of government in, potentially in both countries to restore a normal balance of commercial relationship. Thank you, Malcolm. And a question up here. Thank you. Uh, Alison Penfold, Chief Executive Officer of the Australian Livestock Exporters Council. Uh, my question is to Lynn Bradshaw. Uh, Lynn, we've heard today that uh, there's been significant uh, uh, changes in the regulations around the live export trade, now basically from paddock to the point of processing. Uh, uh, we've got uh, the, the, the industry provides significant employment, particularly in areas where there are few employment opportunities, and that includes Indigenous employment. Uh, that the trade is a key plank of the livestock production economy uh, in this country. Uh, from our perspective, it is very important that we work with RSPCA productively. So my question is, uh, what will it take RSPCA to reconsider and change its existing policy on the livestock export industry? Thank you. Well, to, to have a change in policy it would take unanimous vote of uh, all the states and territories. Um, but notwithstanding that, at the moment, although there's systems in place, uh, as far as the RSPCA is concerned, they don't meet certain of our requirements. Um, compulsory stunning is one of those. Um, and that's basically from a welfare perspective, that's where we stand. And we understand that government may decide to, uh, or has decided to continue for the foreseeable future with the export of live animals for slaughter. Whilst ever that is occurring, the RSPCA will be there working with everybody involved uh, to try and get the best outcomes for the animals, the best welfare outcomes for the animals. So it's not that we're antagonistic in terms of we don't want to work with you. Of course we do. But what we're saying is there's a minimum requirement as we see it, and, and, and unless anybody can prove substantially different, there are still flaws in that uh, system. One final question. 
A question to Mark Ship, Jessica Swan from the ABC. Uh, if we look at SCAS and the MOUs, in the case specifically of Iran and the Egyptian markets, these are new markets. Uh, they're currently being held up. Uh, so if we can talk about that. Uh, my second question is, uh, you talked about funding and you mentioned countries such as Indonesia, Jordan and Egypt. Uh, but if that market to Iran does open up, does that mean that we'll see funding going to that market in light of the sanctions that we currently have there? And just thirdly, what would you say is the biggest challenge to dealing with those Middle Eastern and North African embassies and diplomats here in Australia? Well, <laughs> thank you. Um, so in terms of MOUs, uh, we, we have uh, tried to ensure that uh, we have a guarantee that, that animals will be unloaded on arrival at, at countries of destination. And uh, to facilitate that, we have developed MOUs with a number of countries, uh, particularly in the Middle East. <coughs> uh, some have argued that those MOUs have not been effective, uh, such as the, the difficulties that we had with uh, Bahrain uh, last year. But uh, we, we would uh, respond that uh, those MOUs gave us an opportunity to engage in dialogue. And uh, in some cases, we've uh, been able to avoid uh, the, the problems that we've had in, in those markets simply by referring to the MOUs and uh, getting officials to recognise that we have an arrangement in place whereby they guarantee the unloading of animals uh, before we have a discussion on animal health or, uh, or other concerns. Uh, with that in mind, uh, we uh, would like to, to extend uh, the, the use of MOUs to, to markets, uh, particularly those that are, are vulnerable or, or new, and uh, Iran is, is one of those. So uh, we, we are keen to, to uh, see the development of, of a MOU with Iran. Iran is equally keen. They have uh, agreed to the draft MOU that we've uh, put to them. Uh, we're, we're now working through uh, the, the health protocols and arranging uh, a suitable time to finalise those uh, protocols and, and that MOU. In, in terms of uh, funding, I Iran is not recognised, uh, uh, was not currently on the list of uh, aid recipient countries uh, for Australia, so I don't believe that it would be eligible. I'm not sure if others in the audience from DAF are able to correct me, but that, that's my, my understanding. Um, I'm very reluctant to comment on uh, uh, embassies uh, from the Middle East and, and Africa, North Africa. Uh, I, I think uh, the, the engagement that we've had has been uh, largely uh, very positive in, in that we've been, been able to demonstrate that we are well-intentioned, that we are uh, in trying to work to ensure uh, food security, which, which is a, a critical concern in many of these markets, that we're not going to cut off supply. But in, indeed, we're trying to work towards a sustainable supply of animals in, into those markets. Um, and we have uh, not restrained ourselves to dealing with uh, embassy officials here, but we have uh, travelled extensively uh, to the Middle East, uh, both at, at a government-to-government -government level. We've taken industry delegations with us and, and we've supported uh, industry uh, in sending up their own delegations. So I think that we have done uh, uh, as much as we can and uh, have gone to great lengths to, to try and uh, s support that trade. Can I just add, if, if you could wave that magic wand in terms of communications, what would it actually be? Because it's, it's one thing to go over there, but whilst we're here in Australia, if you can just pick up the phone if you're here in Canberra and you can actually have that communication, what would make it easier for you? Uh, the, the, the great challenge is ensuring that we have a consistent message so that when we go as government or as industry go or if, uh, there are other, other parties involved that we all have, have the same message so that the, the country is hearing the same message consistently and not getting different versions of this is what SCAS requires, it requires an independent audit. Does that mean that the Australian government is going to go there and send an order to, to look over your shoulder? No, it doesn't. It means an independent audit, independent of the Australian government, independent of the exporter. And it's very difficult to get that message through, in part because the message has not been consistent because of, there's been multiple channels, which is a good thing in, in, in other aspects. But it, it's also that there's a reluctance to hear that message that a number of uh, countries have, have said, if we wait long enough, you'll fold. We, we know that if we, if we hold out long enough, 
you're going to change your message. And we've been very consistent to ensure that the message doesn't change, the rules don't change. It doesn't matter if you're Japan or Indonesia, the same rules apply. Thank you, Mark. We'll have to leave it there. I have many questions that I'd like to ask our panellists this afternoon, but we are out of time. Could you please thank Malcolm Jackman, uh, Lynn Bradshaw, Mark Ship, and Michael Harris for their uh, expertise this afternoon?